Good morning. Uh, every day that my wife and I leave our home, uh, my four-year-old boy, my two-year-old daughter stand at the door to wave goodbye to mommy and daddy and Nana. My mother-in-law is standing at the front door, and every time we leave, they say, I love you in my heart. I love you in my heart. I'm wondering this morning if you would join me uh, in a song of love and longing to God, and if you'd be willing to sing it from the heart. As the deer panted for the water so much, So here we are, Lord, and the desire of our heart is to love you and to serve you and to worship you. Remove barriers that stand in our way from the ability to hear clearly from the pages of Scripture. Remove some of the comfortability or malaise that might be setting in for some of us who know what happens in the service next. And instead, give us an eagerness and anticipation, even faith, that you desire to encounter and to speak to us, each of us, through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> So we have been in a sermon series called Holy Habits, talking about the spiritual disciplines which gird the Christian life to aid us in spiritual growth. Pastor Joey began with a sermon on the posture of surrender. As we engage in the disciplines, we need to have a surrendered heart. <clears throat> We've talked about the importance of studying Scripture. We've talked about the importance of prayer and of solitude. We've talked about silence and fasting. And this morning, if you can tell from this passage, we want to spend a little bit of time talking about the discipline of service. <clears throat> so if you look at this text, which maybe for many is familiar, there could be some it's new to. The Bible says that Jesus is, is now aware that his time has come. He knows that his, his death is imminent that he's literally at the precipice. And so he gathers together his disciples just before the Passover festival. The Bible says, having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the very end. So even when what should be consuming his thoughts and his very being is the loss of his own life, he still has set before his heart the ones he's loved well during his time on this earth. And so he thinks of the disciples. He shares yet another meal with them. And as the meal and evening is progressing, the Bible says that Jesus already was aware that the evil one, that the adversary had planted a seed in Judas's heart, that it had in fact taken root and was blossoming up inside of him. But in the midst of that, the Bible says in verse 3 that Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, or some translations say, in his hands. The Father had put all things into his hands and that he had come from God and that he was returning to God. 
It's because of these things that the Father had put all things into his hands that he knew from where he had come and where he was going. This was why Jesus would go on to do the things that he did that we read in this passage that we'll spend some time unpacking. But I want to just stop so that you could pause for a moment and think for yourselves, what has God entrusted into your hands? What do you have authority or influence over? Is it a group of people or friends or students or peers? Is it a talent? Is it a gift? Is it resources? What's in your hand? I think of the story of Moses and the divine encounter that Moses had with God. And God asks Moses to look down and tell him what is in his hand. The Bible also says that Jesus knew from where he had come and where he was going. And a lot of times, part of our journey, part of our purpose in life and destiny is often tied to what's happened before, what we've been through, what we've endured. In first service, we were talking about how often we're uh, looking for somebody. We're looking for that promotion. We're looking for that next step or season in life that will be able to help me, guide me into where I need to go. But a lot of times, because we haven't unpacked or spent time reflecting on where we have been, what we have been through, we don't recognize with what's already in our hand and what God wants to use in our lives to lead us into the way of the future. For Jesus, he knew where he was headed. He knew from whence he had come and, what, and that God had put all things into his hands. And so here is Jesus. The Bible says that because of those things, he could stand up from the meal, gird his waist, take off his outer clothing, gird his waist with the towel around him and begin to pour water into a basin and wash the feet of the disciples. So culturally and socially, it was hospitable to welcome in guests who traveling along dusty roads would have had, with sandals, would have had dirtied feet. And so it was hospitable to set before them a basin and a towel. Many times uh, people would wash their own feet. Sometimes if there was a servant or slave in the house, they might wash someone's feet. But what was interesting that I found was that uh, any home that had a Jewish slave or servant would not wash the feet of another Jew. So it was servant's work, but it was not the work of a Jewish servant. Uh, for the disciples of teachers, the disciples would do many acts of service for their teacher, for their master, for their rabbi, but it was recorded that one thing they would not do was wash the teacher's feet. So here you have disciples of Jesus, and it was culturally and socially understood that they weren't going to do it. And who knows in the home if there was anyone else, but if it was a Jewish servant, they weren't going to do it. But now here is Jesus, who is both teacher, rabbi, and also Jew, and he's standing up from the meal, and he's taking off his outer garment. He's picking up the towel. He's putting water in the basin. This is a redefining moment. Jesus is redefining what servanthood and leadership is all about. He's turning the pecking order of society and culture that he finds himself in on its head. And I'll never forget, one of the first jobs I ever worked was in The Gap. I don't know if anybody still shops at The Gap. I, I, but I worked in The Gap. It was my, one of my first jobs when I was in high school. We had a mall, a shopping mall right next to our high school. I went in there, got my first job. I had to work a graveyard shift, putting security tags onto each individual piece of clothing. Right. And if during the end of, of that um, exhilarating experience in the back room of putting tags on, we finished, we could go out and fold a few pieces of clothing um, in the department store before they would open in the morning. So, uh, again, that job was about as exciting as it sounds, but uh, it was one of my first jobs, and uh, I have these clear memories about it, but I'll never forget one because there was pecking order, as is always when wherever there's a gathering of, of people, and there was a pecking order on that job, and I was at the bottom of the totem pole, 
but you had those graveyard shift back room workers, which was myself. Then you had sales associates. Those are the ones that would work the floor and help the customers. Then you had um, the manage, sales managers that were helping out and overseeing the employees and associates. And then you had the store manager, though, the branch manager for us. And the branch manager was a woman who was both kind but firm. She earned your respect when she walked in the room. I'll never forget that. Didn't know her, get to know her well or anything, but I always uh, knew that she was someone that everybody kind of had respect for. And I'll never forget one night, this was the store branch manager. I'd come in for an earlier shift. I was working in the back room, tagging up articles of clothing, and I had to walk across the back room. And when I walked across the back room, the bathroom door was halfway open, and to my surprise, this, is burned, this image is burned into my mind, I'll never forget, the store or branch manager was in the restroom. She had yellow rubber gloves on, and she was scrubbing the toilet. And I wasn't, I wasn't a Christian at this time. I'd never heard a story like this in the Bible or anything. I just saw that image, and, and I'll, never, I'll, never, I'll never forget it. You see... I was at the bottom of the totem pole, but I was, we, we weren't even asked to do that job. We weren't, you know, they, they paid and hired somebody else to do that kind of work. But it felt like a modern day example of what we see Jesus doing here. He, he was the last one he, for several reasons that would have been grabbing the basin and taking the towel. And yet here Jesus is. I want to read quickly just a few lines from the book Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster, who delineates between self-righteous service and true service. So here's Jesus taking the form of a servant, and I think there's a, there's a clarion and clear truth behind what he's doing, but then there's self-righteous service, and Foster takes some time to delineate between the two, and I want you to just hear this. He says, self-righteous service picks and chooses whom to serve. Sometimes, sometimes the high and powerful are served because they will ensure a certain advantage. Sometimes the low and the defenseless are served because that will ensure a humble image. But true service is indiscriminate in its ministry. It has heard the command of Jesus to be a servant of all. Come on and say amen. Thank you. Self-righteous service is affected by moods and whims. It can serve only when there is a feeling to serve. True service ministers simply and faithfully. Why? Because there is a need. It knows that the feeling, can ser- the feeling to serve can actually become a hindrance to true service. True service disciplines the feelings rather than the feelings controlling our ability to serve. Self-righteous service is temporary. It functions only while the specific acts of service are being performed. Having served, it can now rest easy. But true service is indeed a lifestyle. And it acts from an ingrained pattern of living. It springs spontaneously time and time and time and time again to meet human need. Last one, self-righteous service requires often external rewards. It needs to know that people see and appreciate all my effort. It seeks human applause with proper religious modesty, of course. True service, though, rests contented in hiddenness. It does not fear the lights and blare of attention, but it does not seek after them either. And I love that one, hiddenness. The true service is often tied to the ability to remain unknown, unbroadcasted, untweeted, More than any other single way, and this is an important connection between the virtue of humility and true service in the kingdom of heaven, 
The grace of humility is worked best into our lives through the discipline of service. So when we think about humility as a virtue, we know that we can never gain it by simply seeking it, right? Let me go seek how to be humble. The more we pursue it, the more distant it becomes. To think that we actually have it is evidence that we don't. Right? We know that person that makes the comment every now and then, well, you know I'm really humble. (laughs) And they're being earnest in their assessment of themselves. But we know that when we think we have it, then we probably know we really don't. And so because humility is a virtue that we feel like we can't seek, then we think that there's nothing then that we can do. We just kind of hope that one day maybe we simply get struck with the gift of humility or something and we'll just be humble Christian people, maybe. But actually, of all classical spiritual disciplines, the most conducive for the growth of humility is the discipline of service. It's the willingness to freely give of ourselves for the good of others. No reward needed. Hidden work is okay. Often it's in the hiddenness that there's deep spiritual transformation that happens in the heart when we're not looking for the accolades or the recognition or what we can receive in return. The work of humility begins to take deep roots in our lives. I like this last line Foster gives regarding this. Nothing disciplines the inordinate desires of the flesh like service, and nothing transforms the desires of the flesh like serving in hiddenness. The flesh whines against service, but screams against hidden service. It strains and pulls for honor and recognition. It will devise subtle, religiously acceptable means to call attention to the service that it has rendered, But if we stoutly refuse to give in to the lust of the flesh, we will crucify it. And every time we crucify the flesh, we crucify our pride and our arrogance. I spent time a few weeks ago up in San Francisco with uh, a former pastor of a megachurch in Silicon Valley. And he resigned from that church and went out on a journey internationally to begin seeking the will of God for the next season of his life and his family's life in ministry. And he spent time in both India and China. And there were several stories that struck me when I listened to his meanderings around the world, learning from other leaders and people. But one of the things that really starkly stuck out to me, and I had just spent time last weekend talking to our young adult community about this very thing. There is, I don't know if you've noticed, this burgeoning culture within the broader Christian world right now where everyone wants to fill a stadium and we've got this celebrity pastor culture um, where we've got this prized individual often with very skinny pants and leather jackets and maybe tattoos and just the, the, the ideal icon of cool up there telling us about Jesus, and everybody is giving their lives to Christ, and it's amazing. And I do actually think God is doing some powerful things through ministries and churches and people uh, in in this kind of phenomena that's happening right now in the Christian world. But the antithesis to what we see given rise in America uh, right now in our country, in my opinion, would be time that he spent with leaders in China in the underground church. It's kind of the antithesis. And he told, he told a group of us about a leader that he had spent time with who began to describe uh, the choices that they make in order to fan the flames of the gospel among the people in this country. And the best leaders, he said, in China, in the underground movement, have to make a conscious decision for obscurity and hiddenness. So while in our culture, we're all about uh, uh, propping up these great leaders 
who will kind of lead the way and they're out front and center leading the charge. These great leaders in the underground church movement in China have to go deeper down underground in order to remain hidden and not known because the moment that they are, they'd cease to be able to lead the movement. They'd be discovered and found out and would no longer have influence, be imprisoned and other things. Such a stark contrast, but they've embraced hiddenness, the willingness to serve the body of Christ, and what stuck out to me when he's, is that he had said these were some of the most humble leaders I'd ever met. Just one more here uh, from Dallas Willard, who makes, I think, um, a very poignant point about our ability to serve or any spiritual discipline. He says, there are things that we can do that can be done as a discipline, but they don't have to be. And I think service is a perfect example. We can, as an act of service, do something for someone else on behalf of somebody else as an act of love, as an act of righteousness. We can just do that. But what he says is, <clears throat> when we choose, for example, the act of service and make it a discipline, we are choosing to practice that discipline in order to enhance my ability to follow Christ. So for example, I will practice the discipline of service to train myself away from some of the arrogance, possessiveness, envy, resentment, or covetousness I have in my life. You see, in that case, my service is undertaken to discipline my spiritual life. And I think going back to John 13, some of that is what we see playing out. The disciples we know in the gospel narratives have been arguing over who will be the greatest. There is covetousness. There is this envy. There is this desire to be placed ahead of the pack. James and John, their mother wants to know, will they get the little thrones right next to your throne, Jesus? And now here's Jesus getting up from the meal with towel and basin, giving them a window of insight into who they are, what's deepest inside their hearts, and leading them into the practice of the very same thing. There is this exchange with Peter. You probably heard it. It goes back and forth. Peter says, uh, 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 wait, maybe him, maybe him, but you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus says, look, you don't even understand what I'm doing right now, but you will. Eventually, you will. And Peter says, no, 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 you're not going to wash my feet. And he says, well, look, if you don't wa wash my feet, then you won't have any part with me. You won't have any share with me. And, and I can kind of imagine Peter, he's already got his, like, shirt halfway up his stomach at that point, right? Because he's ready to throw it off. And, okay, it's bath time, Jesus. Let's just wash me, wash me all, all the way, everything. But then Jesus washes the feet of the disciples and he begins to lay out before them the example that he set and what they don't realize now but that Jesus is confirming for them that they will realize is that the washing of their feet is symbolic of his humiliating death upon the cross by which spiritual cleansing was made possible. It was a foreshadow to what he was about to endure. He know, knew he was at the precipice, and he so, chose something common and ordinary, and yet something that was never expected of him to teach them what kind of lives they would live, marked by servants, in perpetu uh, perpetually, uh, even to the very church uh, to, of this day. This was the mind of Christ. This is why the Apostle Paul could say in Philippians that we are to have this same attitude, this same mind of Christ who had equality with God but became, took on the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and even gave himself over to obedience, death on a cross. This was the posture of our Lord and he was showing them now the life, the marked life that they would live to reflect his unyielding and unwavering love, sacrificial love on their behalf. This, just this last piece he says here, he speaks to them in blessing and says, very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their masters, therefore you are to do likewise, and if you do these things, you will be blessed. 
there is a blessing that Jesus speaks of that is not in the knowing, it's in the doing. It's not in the knowing, it's in the doing. And I wanna just say this morning, as we try to bring it home for our community, we're saying, as you heard Pastor Otis describe, that we're going to do a service on behalf of the community, but we're going to do it in a new way. And that has the potential to go really well or to not go so well. But in my mind, I see the lives and stories of families at stake. And I think, and I think that there are stories in our congregation that are meant to be birthed this Thanksgiving season that God wants to do for our congregation on behalf of our community. So a lot of times when we see natural disasters wreaking havoc throughout our world or senseless act of violence as we have talked and prayed over this day, it always comes back to, well, what can I do? And those are tough questions. My young adults just today down at the basement of Wong Ker Lee were talking about what can we do? And we have to explore those. But you know what? We ha we do what we do know is we have an opportunity right here we're, we're probably not gonna be reading front page articles on whatever news feed you have about Sam, families in San Bernardino that won't have Thanksgiving this year. That one's probably not gonna make it on your Facebook feed. But, but those stories exist. And we have an opportunity to stand in the gap and to practice the discipline of service on behalf of our community. And my prayer this morning as you listen to this song is that the example of, that, that Christ would lead us as he has set forth the example to follow as a community.